podcast. Uh, hello, uh, we've got the Patrick Lennon today for the Master of Data Science final presentation. And I hand over to Patrick for his uh, project was on deep learning approaches to forest trading algorithm. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Matt Lube, and thank you, Ling. Good evening to all. Um, as mentioned, I'll be presenting my capstone project on deep learning approaches to forex trading algorithms. So to begin and provide a bit of a background, I'll first touch on the uh, forex, foreign exchange market. So a foreign exchange rate or a currency exchange rate, it can be defined as a reflection of relative value between one nation's currency and another, um, sometimes also referred to in terms of purchasing power between uh, one economy's currency and another. Now talking about the market itself, Forex, or sometimes abbreviated just to the letters FX, is the most fa traded financial product and liquid market globally. So we have over 6 trillion daily traded volumes. Uh, this exceeds the equity or commonly known as the stock market. It is an operation that runs 24 hours a day for five days a week. Other financial instruments, commodities, stocks, fixed income, uh, their exchanges are typically open sort of around seven to eight hours a day. Um, Over-the-counter products can sometimes trade a bit outside of these areas, uh, but nowhere near as the 24-hour coverage from the FX market. And there's a significant um, uh, combination of currency pairs, uh, over 150, um, all combinations of one nation or one economy's currency against another. Uh, talking about sort of exchange rate dynamics in the market itself, it's influenced by many factors, uh, prim primarily macroeconomic factors, uh, usually referred or looked to in a uh, longer term. This can be uh, items such as inflation. So one currency's inflation is rising uh, domestically, their currency is depreciating in value or losing purchasing power. So another currency might appreciate against it. Uh, interest rates are very important as well. Um, there's a relationship uh, referred to as sort of uh, interest rate parity when looking at currencies and interest rates. The basic premise being that a uh, rising or higher interest rate in one country that compared to another means that a return on financial instruments and debt securities will be uh, greater than the other. So there's a higher demand for that currency such that they can reap the higher returns. Um, there's a variety of other macroeconomic factors. Another example being uh, trade balances. So one country is exporting to another currency, uh, sorry, another country. Um, the other current country will need to uh, purchase more of that exchange or that currency. So the, uh, it gets bid up and it appreciates in value. A few other factors, uh, general news and events, the political or other sort of surprises or shocks to the market. These can cause sort of risk sentiments and uh, change the dynamics or any, any sentiment or um, consideration of the currency. And finally, what we're looking into is uh, market sentiment and trends, specifically in the uh, short term. So these can be whether uh, traders or other market participants uh, feel a certain way and the market gains momentum. And these can be looked at through technical indicators or technical analysis, which is looking at mathematical formulas or statistical relations that describe and uh, can put the trends into numbers for uh, how a currency price is behaving. Now the data itself, um, it's a numeric data and initially it comes with four common fields. Uh, open, which is at one interval, the uh, starting price of the, the exchange rate. Pi, which is the highest it reaches in that interval. Low and close, and volume is sometimes also used. It is looked to in uh, bar or candlestick charts. So these are bars or candles reflect to one interval of time, be it five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour. And by nature of the data, it is time series and sequential. So um, it's a time series and we look at it um, one, one sequence ahead of another kind of thing. I'm um, looking at some visualizations of this below is a Euro USD currency pair. It's a bar chart plotted with um, five minutes. So you can see here, um, these bars reflect different sort of time frequencies and the candlestick um, sort of nature comes from these, these patterns or visual aspects that reflect the, uh, the highest, lowest, open and close. And on the right hand side, we see a brief description of what this looks like in a numerical format. I'm talking about actual data trends and deep learning. Uh, two points are quite trivial, the data availability and consumption has grown significantly. Along with that, so it's computing power over the past years and touching on a few uh, notable sort of achievements or developments in the field of neural networks. We have the, uh, in the past decade, the gated recurrent unit introduced in 2014, uh, the residual network or ResNet um, introduced in 2015, and the concept of self-attention or the transformer model introduced in 2017. To provide a bit of a guidance on these uh, first two points here, here is a, um, some visualization from some sources, Statistica and Our World and Data. The first uh, reflects sort of their 
historical captured data on how consumption of data has evolved over time, as well as their forecasts. And on the right hand side, we see a log linear chart of Moore, a reflecting Moore's chart, which describes the, uh, the concept of computing power doubling every two years. So given this is a log linear chart, we also see that it's uh, exponential in nature. Um, lastly, talking about some related works, there's been a range of studies on um, sort of conducted on FX price prediction and forecasting, incorporating machine learning and deep learning models. Uh, a variety of models or architectures explored, so ranging from recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and reinforcement learning networks. Uh, the last point, reinforcement learning sort of uses a, uh, an agent, and then the uh, reward system is based on profitability that it achieves in a trading environment. Um, to steer it in the direction of where this study is going, there's been classification, classification frameworks implemented in this, uh, in this kind of problem, but most of them have been involved around prediction, predicting or classifying the direction of a trade. So simply if uh, a one may reflect the price is gonna be higher in 10 or 20 periods ahead, zero reflecting it will be lower, or multi-class, one for higher, zero for minimal movement, and negative one for uh, no movement in the next few bars. Bringing us to the motivation, um, looking or considering the technical analysis in the short-term trends, we look to validate uh, trading based on these technical analysis alone, explore different kind of uh, technical, technical indicators and how they perform. Secondly, look to transcribe this to a classification framework uh, that supplements these strategies. So as opposed to a simple prediction and uh, predicting in the next X bars ahead, we look to classify if a uh, trading strategy or a signal is profitable or not. To the last point, uh, a focus on profitability as opposed to predictability or accuracy of the models. With this in mind, a, uh, a model that is highly accurate or has strong predictions may not perform too well in a trading environment. Uh, one reason may be that a majority of the accuracy is achieved during low volatile periods where the price doesn't move around too much and the minority of inaccurate predictions are achieved when the price is moving around quite significantly. So this means minimal profit is captured during the accurate periods and then severe losses are caused during the inaccurate periods. So again, drilling home the point that accuracy doesn't always sort of uh, transcribe to profitability in a training framework. Onto our methods and starting with data collection and preparation, uh, the data source used was MetaTrader 5. This is a trading platform that many, many users use and is very popular around the retail base. Uh, one strength of it is it allows traders or applicants to connect directly to market brokers or market makers. So they can explore or use a range of data sources. Centered this uh, project around Euro USD as the currency pair. Uh, the Euro nation and the USD, they're the, one of the top in terms of GDP and well-known nations. So it's trivial that the Euro USD is one of the most liquid currency pairs. And then in terms of timeframes, observe this study with one minute or five minute intervals. Uh, this was to maximize the amount of data we could use as well as maximize the number of trades. This last point was important on two fronts. Firstly, um, looking at a, a trading algorithm, we wish to be quite greedy or maximize as many trades we can. So shortening the intervals seemed a way to achieve this. Um, secondly, maximizing the number of trades when looking at classifying whether a trade is uh, profitable or not, this data that you're classifying is based on the number of trades you have. So the more number of trades, the more data you can train from, thus looking to use a shorter time frame. Some other preparation techniques went in place um, to set this up to be trained, but also to uh, set up a realistic testing framework. So there's this concept of open, high, low, and close that we've touched on, but also market brokers or market makers will apply some sort of a spread or cost when executing an order uh, to, sub, uh, to compensate them for taking risk. So this was applied to the open, high, low, close data in the testing framework to make it more realistic. This is quite important if we're making a lot of trades and we're not factoring in a, a realistic bid ask spread then one strategy that can be perceived to be quite profitable, once it's actually implemented on the live market, may be eaten away with its spread. Um, a limitation here was that bid and ask spreads were only available from 2021 to 22. So two data sets were created with a total of five years of data. The first data set used for realistic testing was 2021 to 2022, concatenating the open, high, low, close and bid and ask. And then a uh, more basic data set from 2017 to 2021 with just the open high low close data was used. This was to use a, uh, to get a bit of a lengthier data set even though it wasn't completely realistic, but this was used for mapping processes as opposed to strategy evaluation. Finally, in terms of quality of the data, it came from trusted brokers and the, the quality was what was seen in the market. Uh, the biggest risk or sort of point to observe was any gaps in the data. 
Um, so this was measured, say for example, we have one minutely data, we observe uh, a print at midnight or a data point at midnight, and then a data point at 1202. That means that we haven't received a, a data point at 1201, so we've got a gap in the data, and that's what this metric refers to. So we can see here that the uh, amount of gaps or missing points in data was relatively low. Um, the maximum was 0.15% for the, um, one, of the, one of the data sets in the one minute zone. So relatively satisfied with the data set and no real clean needed because it came from a trust broker. So going towards our methods now, firstly starting with a backtest framework. Uh, backtest framework, it's, it's the best way to uh, test and evaluate how a strategy is performed by simulating how a, uh, a, an environment that reflects the market. Some basic ideas of how a backtest may work, uh, setting some input data, so specific currency, frequency, time, initial parameters, such as stop loss and take profit, and a trading strategy. We're iterating over the data, and we return a uh, trading, trading signal at every point. Then a broker agent uh, simulates an action based on this trading signal. So whether this is a buy, sell, have we already bought, are we already long kind of thing. Uh, at every iteration as well, check our limit conditions at each iteration, and then finally provide some output for the breakdown of performance. A backtest is critical for evaluating the profitability of the strategy and the best way to emulate what it's like in the real market, but also um, useful for these mapping processes. If we simulate a backtest, we can then use those results to feed into a classification model um, and map towards or classify whether a trade was profitable or not. So here's a brief outline without going through it all, the flow chart of how the backtest back test might work. We have our initial parameters set up. All of that is sort of combined and initialized. Price data is fed iteratively to a trading strategy. It exports some indicator data that we can use for mapping as well as a signal. A signal handler agent or a broker object can handle this by uh, sort of setting the environment to a condition where a trade has been made as well as checking for our um, sort of limits. This signal handler can, connect, can concatenate and finalize the history data into some report functions, which is all fed back through to the main environment. And finally, we get a bit of output reflecting the full history, some summaries based on a trade or weekly basis, as well as a, a final summary with a, a clear and concise view of how the backtest is operated. Moving on to our indicator selection, some common indicators selected as basic strategies, so ones that are well seen in our various financial literature. Uh, Bollinger Bands, Parabolic SAR, Stochastic Oscillators, etc. Our process was then went through to find some more complicated strategies by reviewing these visually on charts and seeing if they led to any sort of visual or obvious breakouts. On a final note, there are some indicators that use charts and uh, provide a bit of an ambiguous or subjective view of um, any patterns reviewed in the data. These were indicated but found tricky to implement explicitly in a coding framework. Uh, just given that they can range, the, uh, the parameters uh, can be quite global and there's no sort of, sorry, quite local and there's no global set for uh, how many bars we look at, what ranges, and they're sort of very subjective. So only one of these was successfully achieved in a coding framework. To push back on that last point about the strategy research and combining indicators, here's an example of uh, observations made combining the Donchian channel and commodity channel index. So sort of Standard these standard indicators, there are signals of whether the commodity channel index is above or below 100 or negative 100. And if the high price is above or below the uh, low price respectively, sorry, above the bands respectively for the low price. So here's an example. We see the commodity channel index breaching this 100 bullish signal, as well as hitting the, uh, the Donchian channel being breached by the high price. And we can see here that it's led to a, quite an appreciation in price. So this looks to be an example of a, um, a complicated strategy or a combination strategy developed. And this was repeated for these kind of strategies here, finding sort of positions or visually observing when they may uh, lead to a breakthrough. Now, the main model that was looked at here is what I refer to as the signal of firma. The basis of this is that we get a, uh, an indicator strategy and we get a uh, signal from it. And then we train a neural network to evaluate and predict whether that prediction or that trading signal will actually lead to a profitable trade or not. So the uh, main framework we've implemented is at the bottom here. We have our data being passed through and we get an indicator signal. So this may be from a uh, parabolic SAR. It's, it's produced a, uh, a short signal. Now our trained signal or firmer model will evaluate if that will uh, lead to a profitable trade or not. And then we use this for our final trading signal. And the process to set this uh, training framework up was on the left here. We initially get uh, use the realistic backtesting framework to obtain results of the indicator alone, uh, looking at whether it's profitable, 
but also other aspects, whether it makes a lot of trades, is there a decent win or a promising win ratio, et cetera. Um, so may lead that an may be looking for an unprofitable trade that exhibits characteristics that we could make it profitable. Secondly, we now test this back on the more basic data set, but a longer period. So we now get a, a more comprehensive history and data that we can use to feed into the neural network. We map, do a mapping process. So whether a signal has been profitable, we uh, apply a signal of one, or whether it's been unprofitable, apply a target of zero. Use this data, which looks about like this for a uh, one set of sequence, and we train it. So basically we've got our price, history, uh, price data, we've got our indicator, and we've got the signal that's included um, because what we're looking to see is maybe a certain pattern, and then a, a strategy is indicated a uh, bullish signal if the price has behaved in a certain way, that may be um, an incorrect signal, but if the price has behaved in a different way and a signal is bullish, um, that might explain if it's a profitable signal or not. So this may be one snap of the input data and ultimately we're classifying in a binary sense, uh, one or a zero for whether it's uh, profitable or not. The second kind of classification model set up um, is this content concept I think of as a no limit hit. So essentially we're looking to uh, generate a, a uh, an optimal or a perfect sort of trading history. So we go through a data set and apply some mapping. At each point, we're trying to find a trade that A, generates a profit greater than a specified minimum profit level. So I want to find all these trades that have uh, exceeded 20 pips, 50 pips or so. B, it can be exited within a specified number of bars. So I want this to be efficient. I want to find trades that can be entered and exited within 50, 100 bars. And most importantly, C, we meet, wish to make sure that this doesn't get hit by a stop loss within that time. So it hits this, uh, it can definitely be entered and executed and hit our minimum profit level. So we apply this mapping process and then sort of provide a signal or a direction of where that trade is. Is it a long trade? Is it a short trade? And then as well, add some indicators as features. So this is all based on just the close price, but we also add some technical indicators that may be useful in the training process. There were some issues or some limitations with the no limit hit model, although it's a our perfect data set actually classifying this is quite a big task and a pretty big question to ask such a, uh, such a model. Firstly, similar with the sim signal or firmer model, there's quite a, um, quite a label imbalance. So it's uh, a lot of zeros. This perfect criteria that we've set up, um, it's not going to be hit. It's going to be, sorry, it's going to be hit a minority of the time. Uh, we should expect in a minority of these trades or situations to be perfect. So this was handled by using the simple Keras class weight parameter. So this means more weight is applied to actual signals as opposed to a, um, a zero signal. Um, secondly, and more interestingly, uh, the type of misclassification was important in this framework. Um, classifying a signal in the wrong direction is far worse than classifying a zero signal or classifying as no trade at all. Uh, this means uh, this is because classifying the wrong direction is actually unprofitable as opposed to uh, making no profit. So the techniques applied here was looking to use a weighted categorical cross ent entropy so this is using a categorical cross entropy, but applying a uh, cost matrix. So for example, here we have a, um, an, actual, an actual negative one prediction. If it's predicted as zero, that's sort of weighted as normal. If it's predicted in the wrong direction, apply a higher cost and likewise for um, an actual long trade. Um, so basically predicting a zero or predicting a one in this scenario, they're both a wrong classification, but predicting the one is a far worse outcome. And to touch on, I'll briefly go through some of the models and techniques used. Um, very common to look at these recurrent neural network variants. This is a gated recurrent unit, uh, LSTM, and a great, and a, um, the vanilla recurrent network, neural network itself. Uh, both attempted with a predictor and a classifier framework. So here's a brief outline of these below. Also some extended models looked at was applying positional encoding. So this means that we have the uh, or original sequence data, but we also use a cosine or a sine function to apply um, a value for where it appears. And this can be applied to the transformer model, which also introduces the uh, concept of self-attention. So some of the, um, the final mo model architectures used was ResNet feature extraction. So ResNet is a well-known model that is based on a convolutional neural network. Um, this can be commonly used in image data, but also can be applied to time series data through reshaping and resizing uh, to extract useful features or patterns that may occur in the data. Um, here is a brief outline of how some of these architectures may look. So for a predictor model, this is classifying 10 steps ahead what the price was. We may set it up with a recurrent neural network variant like this. So 120 sequence links, training a, a relatively small number of bar, uh, epochs, 
as to not overfit um, using an atom optimizer and mean squared error as the loss function. The binary classification problem of the signal affirma. This is also with a um, one of the models used was a current neural network variant. Um, similar kind of setup, but in this case, we're using binary cross entropy and a sigmoid activation function. Uh, finally, with the no limit hit for the multi class classification problem, a uh, similar kind of setup, but we're using a softmax uh, with three output neurons. And these are examples of, uh, of after a bit of um, architecture tweaking and parameter tuning, um, the predictor and the signal of firma were relatively similar, but the no limit hit it was found actually that making a shallow network and also incorporating this uh, concept of return sequences from the recurrent neural network variants or using a time distributed dense, then flattening it was a bit more effective. Looking at some of these extended models, um, the, using the positional encoding data and the ResNet feature instruction initially was first fed into a basic uh, multi-layer perceptron. So this has been flattened now and that we have 3072 encoded dimensions using a uh, range of features across all. So this was now incorporating a wider feature set the original pricing data, as well as all of our indicators that were selected. Then looking at the transformer, these were the kind of metrics used, the number of heads, feed forward dimensions, number of transformers, and the multi-layer perceptron units. And finally, uh, combining the positional encoded data reshaped back to the long short-term memory was similar as before. Um, we just have a bit more features and a wider sequence input use in these scenarios. Looking back at the, um, the basic strategy results or the indicator results, um, there are some mixed results here looking at the realistic data set from 2021 to 2022. It was found that some of the trend indicators, such as the commodity channel index, parabolic SAR, and the combination of the Donchi channel and commodity channel index performed rather well. Um, one interesting thing that was pointed out is the, um, the win ratio is and loss ratio is relatively 50-50, but it still retained a profit. The reason being, um, is that the indicator actually predicted good times to exit the trade as well. It wasn't always necessarily stopped out. So the average win, uh, the average profit on a win trade exceeded that of the average loss on a losing trade. Another common uh, pattern picked up was the um, shorter timeframes, the one minute data actually performed well. And it was deemed that this was just quite noisy to use such a short time frame, um, sort of quite susceptible to any sort of volatility or noise. So there seemed to be a bit of a sweet spot using the five minute data. If we look at uh, the basic predictive deep learning models, they performed quite well on an uh, mean absolute percentage error and root mean square error basis. Um, but this then ties back to the initial comments that a decent accuracy score, although it is noted that these aren't fantastic, they still seem to be relatively okay, um, performed quite poorly in the realistic backtest. Looking at the signal affirma model, we found here that the um, common themes were seemed, uh, common themes were seen based on the indicator. Indicators performed well, also did well when the signal affirmal was applied and vice versa. Uh, but most interesting results here, if we compare it to the original strategy, um, the most interesting takeaway is the, the trade win ratio has increased and significantly for some. So for example, the commodity channel index performed most well over this period. When we apply the signal affirmer or correct uh, the way to sort of confirm if a trade is accurate or not, uh, we see about a 20% win ratio in, in this kind of strategy. And this is consistent across all, even though it's minimal for the um, Bollinger Bands. But then a key takeaway as well is the profit, the absolute profit and loss decreases in magnitude. And this is seen because the signal affirmer is restricting the amount of trades made and it is uh, sort of evaluating or putting in signals that will um, not be executed. We see the number of trades decrease and at the end of the day, the sort of raw profit and loss decrease in magnitude. Looking at some of these extended models, it was found that the positional encoding provided the uh, best result. This is because, because it was the, uh, the time series data is sequential in nature and the way that the trends and the indicators work, it was seen that retaining further information about where the position is in the sequence uh, performed quite well. Interestingly to note as well that the ResNet feature instruction performed relatively poorly, uh, gave quite, to, quite extreme results and showed signs of overfitting. So for the ResNet feature extraction, it, it would provide um, classifications all of one class and recall or precision values of one or zero. Similarly, with these our preferred models using positional encoding, we compare these with the original strategy, similar kind of theme seen. Win ratio has increased, although not as much by the um, original trade uh, signal firmer strategies. But then again, number of trades has decreased and the total profit has uh, decreased. <coughs> Finally, looking at these no limit hit models, um, an initial observation, as mentioned before, it's quite a um, quite a big task or a question to ask a model, predict me the, uh, or classify me the perfect trades. 
Um, the initial models were set up in this kind of uh, framework of mapping. So one set was using that, I want to make 40 pips, not be stopped out within a 20 pip limit. And I want to find a trade in 20, 200 bars, sorry. Even with applying weighted categorical cross entropy, um, the confusion matrix sort of shows that it's quite symmetrical, meaning that a lot of poor trades are being decided. The accuracy score isn't great if we're looking at the model to make a prediction on its own. And then at the end of the day, reflected in the realistic backtest, they are um, a losing sort of trading strategy. This was likewise for um, even with a different kind of mapping characteristic, 30 pips made without hitting a 20 pip stop loss in 50 bars. Uh, we see everything's quite skewed, a bit asymmetric here. Decent accuracy that's skewed by a lot of zeros being pre uh, predicted, but at the end of the day, a losing trading strategy. So a discussion on the actual metrics of the deep learning models, what was found across um, sort of architecture or parameter tuning is the long short-term memory provided the most consistent results across the re recurrent neural network variants. Um, not only was accuracy looked at, but precision was highly weighted in making the decision because at the end of the day, we're looking to uh, maximize the number of predict, pre uh, predict, pardon me, correct predictions made or correct trades made. Another metric that was looked at was the uh, ratio of incor incorrect trades reduced compared to cor correct trades reduced. So if um, a trade was made more efficient, but it significantly dropped the number of trades made, this was undesirable. The predictor models showed relatively decent uh, mean absolutes percentage error scores. The signal or thermal models, when we were looking at pre precision, the uh, precision was the main metric and it stayed around 25 to 35%. So it wasn't uh, fantastic, although this was consistent across all the uh, variations of the models. When looking at the extended models, positional, positional encoding tied with LSTM was the most consistent extension. Uh, this was thought to be that it both cap really captures the um, position and the sequential nature of the data. It's uh, positionally encoded, so we know, or the network knows whereabouts uh, a data point lies in the sequence. And then also passing this through the long short term memory means it retains memory of where it is in the state. The transformer results weren't terrible, but they were sort of relatively average and not as good as a long short term memory. Um, it's considered here that maybe given the way a transformer works and the, the concept of self attention, perhaps that the whole, the whole um, sequence doesn't need to be considered, but what we're really looking for is uh, capturing the positions in the data. And finally, as discussed, the ResNet feature extraction performed quite poorly. Um, and there may be the case that the, this kind of network or a CNN in this, in this environment or the task that we're looking for doesn't perform well or that the pre-trained rates on the ResNet 50 are just not designed for this classification task. Um, taking this away to now the actual backtest results performed, the vanilla strategy shows some mixed results. Um, some of them were profitable in shorter periods, but when we went to do the mapping processes over the four-year data, about all of them were uh, performing poorly. So it shows that vanilla strategies may work um, in some periods of time, but none of these were consistent over a long period. The predictive models, again, they predict, proved to be poor in the back test. So this was predicting what the price may be in 20 bars and making a decision off that. The signal thermal models, as mentioned, they improved the accuracy, but reduced the profit and loss for successful strategies through a lower trade count. The no limit hit models just simply put perform poorly in the back test. And then the vanilla long short term memory exhibited a higher win ratio than the extended model. So this was on the commodity channel index or the best performing strategy. The vanilla LSTM was better than including any sort of um, positional encoding. Um, to touch on some limitations, um, in terms of a trading framework, a static stop loss and take profit was implemented. Um, this was at 15 pips and symmetrical. So 15 pip take profit, 15 pip take uh, stop loss. This was done just to be consistent across the um, across the experiments, and it's noted that maybe applying a dynamic limit process or experimenting further or making these limits asymmetric may be a way to capture more profit. Um, the training data used in these classification models was limited to the number of trade. So what I mean by that is we may have a data set that's got over a, over a hundred thousand bars. The trading strategy may only make. 3,000, 4,000 trades. So we're uh, limited to only 4,000 data points in the um, deep learning model. And this may not be suitable as we're aware, deep learning models are, are really effective when there's a, a large amount of data and 4,000 to 5,000 data points is not great. Finally, process runtime. Uh, some of these complicated uh, indicators when running a back test, especially over the four year period, very timely, as well as incorporating a, a deep learning model. 
And this also extended to the mapping processes. So any tweaks or any um, adjustments we'd like to make and sort of a lot of kind of comparison of parameter tuning was quite tricky. Um, as an example, some of the complicated strategies took upwards of 14 hours to run. So trying to run multiple at once or a wide range of comparison was tricky to do. Some points for extension, um, looking at maybe with, with the way that the classification models performed, even though the uh, accuracy metrics or precision metrics weren't great, uh, one way to look at this may be to incorporate extra features. The feature set with those indicators mentioned, plus some um, transformations on the open, high, low, and closed data. And there could be a wide range of ways to transform the data, include other indicators or uh, factors that aren't even technical indicators into the classification models. Um, explore some other architectures for the classification framework, uh, primarily the no limit hit models didn't perform quite well. If there's a way to uh, or an architecture to nail or a certain set of uh, network parameters to achieve, uh, sort of training or being successful in this classification problem would be quite rewarding. And finally, um, looking at a way to aggregate strategies. So some way to uh, implement or simulate multiple strategies acting at once, um, such that we can get more data or a complicated, complicated strategy set. In conclusion, this study looked at basic indicators, combination indicators, and charting strategies. We observed how they work, got context of how they operate and how they've done historically, as well as coding them up mathematically. An important um, feature added here was the backtesting framework that provided a lot more uh, features, customization, as well as um, using auxiliary data for the mapping processes. Um, experimented with some deep learning strategies and saw what was seen in other literature that high accuracy, accuracy scores don't always lead to profitability. I set up some classification problems, both the signal affirmer framework and the no limit hit framework, as well as the associated mapping processes. And finally, we trained these classification models, explored different types of architectures and parameters. So from this study, a key takeaway is that evidence suggests that deep learning can improve the accuracy of trading strategies. Uh, what we saw is it is ineffective on its own as the sole decision maker of a strategy. So the uh, points I draw to here, we saw our win ratios increase or improve using the signal affirmer model, um, but the no limit hit model and the, uh, the predictive models on their own were quite unprofitable as trading strategies. So thank you for listening. Um, please now let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, I didn't fully get that. Uh, what do you mean by that um, sole deep learning as a sole decision maker? So what I mean, the, um, the strategies where we saw this to be effective was when we were using a deep learning model combined with a uh, technical indicator. So we weren't the predictor, the predictor strategies and the neural yeah. network strategies that was passing data through. And we just let the neural network make our trading just strategy on their own yeah the okay. of, yeah that's on. great that's our uh, consistent with our um, other studies and our experience okay yeah. that uh, and in your uh, opinion with all this uh, testing and everything what do you think was the most promising thing to further investigate or test for realistic trading when you talk about test for the uh, the latter point, test for real realistic trading, are you uh, sort of asking what we might do on the trading strategy basis or what we might do? Yeah, like uh, well, like you, you tested so many things now, you want to pick up the most promising and want to apply on a real trading, like the real market. Which one do you think? My my favorite model, or the one that seemed best to me, was the um, the commodity channel index applying the, the signal affirmer. Um, that showed to reduce the trade count and improve profitability and accuracy. But in terms of extending this and how to get to a, a, a how we can progress from here, I think the main answer is to find a very aggressive trading algorithm, something that um, we can we can use a huge number of trades and really really refine and cut it down. Um, can you share the results like, again, or what was the results for that uh, signal at format? Yeah. So the the final PNL was. Um, 4,000 pips um, when it was cut down or the accuracy was improved to 70%. So I'm aware this might be biased in the one year period, but what I mean by a more aggressive algorithm, if we're uh, decreasing 3,000 trades to 600, what if we scale that up, find an indicator or a period of time where that's now 10,000 trades, 20,000 trades, um, the, the sort of refined number of trades, 2,000, 3,000, 
um, and then we can get a, a, a strategy that trades a lot and then is also has its uh, accuracy improved. Like after uh, 600, out of 665 trades, how many won? Um, 70%. So, okay, mean, so about um, 70%. Uh, bear with me, it's maybe. I don't have the full, the full back test results from it. Just the, um, just the percentage, which I, I can provide. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's fine. So seventy percent gives an idea. Um, but given that uh, it's fifteen pips um, profit and fifteen pips loss, uh, seventeen pip. 17% uh, could be a risky. Um, but there's also a lot of room to uh, like work on the- But uh, you didn't you... try uh, in increasing the uh, take profit? No, the, re the mm -hmm. reason being is um, because the model was trained on, that was something that was considered, but because the, uh, the classification problem was based on trades that were made with the 15 pip, last 15 pip uh, take profit, Widening this may mean that what we're trying to predict is inconsistent with what we've trained the model on. Mm. So what, what I mean by that is a, is a trade that's profitable with a 15 pip take profit may not be profitable with a 30 pip take profit. It may reach 20 pips, so it satisfies the first condition, but it doesn't hit 30 pips and maybe it goes into a loss period. So it was um, what I saw the best way is keep it consistent about what we've classified and then what we test with. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and uh, is that the sig signal affirmative thing? Is that the same, the, like uh, the LSTM plus positional encoding? Yes, yeah, that was um, that was the same framework. So transform, use the same data, same classification problem, but just apply positional encoding. Uh, how's your positional encoding works? If you can explain that a bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, so what we're looking at in positional encoding, we have a, um, Framework with this, bear with me. So we have uh, 120 by X features. Uh, what we've seen in the positional encoding uh, may be this from a cosine or a sine function. So if you think of this trans transcribed or transposed, um, 0 0.14, 0 0.29, 0 0.43, and so on. In this kind of sine function all the way down to 120. And then this was simply added to the um, added to this kind of data. So it would be the open price at this point plus 0 0.14, high price plus 0 0.14, then this would be plus 0 0.29. So it was flat across all of them. And then you, you simply add them together. Right. Okay, so Ling, do you have any question? Yeah. So I noticed that you're using um, positional encoding plus long short term memory. So normally positional encoding is used in the transformer for the um, to compute where and uh, what to pay attention to incorporate yes. with the multi-head attention. So here you used in the long short term memory. Did you also compute the uh, multi-head attention as well? Yes. So I um. Bear with me, I'll get the metrics up for the attention model. But this, this of course, was using, so the transformer model here with the um, yeah. number of heads and the, the few four dimensions and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, it's important to note that this, so the um, long short term memory and positional encoding was reshaped. So the data was concatenated, um, flattened, applied positional encoding, and then reshaped. And that same data set was used in the transformer model. So this was the, um, the relevant or required features or dimensions used, but this also has that same additive positional encoding placed on it. Okay, thank you. And I do have something I was thinking to ask you. Uh, is that which page? Is it page 19? Uh, this, this is 20. Yeah, can you go to page 19? I noticed that you only trained 25 epochs. Yeah. Is there any reason you only train for 25 yeah. epochs? Yeah, of course. Um, bear with me. I have a tuning metrics. Um, so it was found, 
so basically, given the the number of the um the data set was relatively like small in the concept of big data and deep learning, we had a few thousand few thousand data points. Um, it was found that sort of 25 epochs was the sweet spot and any greater than that seemed to be overfitting. Um, so in the terms of the baseline LSCM model, um, it was trained it was part of the um, parameter tuning process to extend this to 50 epochs. Um, and it was seen that the, the scores didn't improve, the, um, primarily looking at the precision score and the accuracy score. Uh, they didn't exceed when training on more epochs. And I think that again, ties back to the case where um, there's not a huge amount of data, so the networks actually learn relatively quickly. Okay, so yes, yeah, fine. And also, you have totally twelve features. Did you scale all of this? Yeah, um, in all of the models, row-wise scaling was applied. Okay, so you don't have any categorical feature. All of your features are numerical. Uh, correct, but on that note, and sorry, just to contradict myself um, on that last point. When we look at the um, an example of the of the training input, um, the signal. So these were all scaled row wise. The signal mm -hmm. was kept as the final signal, and that was treated as a categorical variable. So this wasn't scaled; it was kept as one, negative one, or zero. Um, and the idea with this again is that whether a trade is being predicted as long or short, that's um, somewhat categorical, but there's no real need to need to scale it because it will be the only occurrence in this in the series. But that's but uh, is, that's your label, isn't it? Uh, that is what the trading signal has outputted, but the label is whether it's true or not. So these are related. That well, these aren't related necessarily. These are different. Okay. So if I've I predicted a long trade, uh, long trade, I can predict it wrong. But I still thought it was important to capture whether the trade was being predicted as long or short, as that might tie whether it's correct or not. Okay, so this signal is uh, is an input, right? It's a categorical input. Correct. How did you treat this categorical input? I just kept it. I think you are correct, Ling. I, I just kept it as numerical. It would be reflected by oh, one, okay. zero, yeah. one or negative one. So my, yeah. my mindset was it was categorical. It's sort of a um, binary feature, yep. but no sort of uh, word embedding or anything along those lines or numerical based on technical indicators. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you thought about this signal used the embedding and then concatenate with other, other uh, numerical features? Yes, yeah, so that was considered, but I thought that the, the reflection of a, um, a numerical value still persisted the information we needed, um, whether it's one or negative one. But I think so. There could be a, a way to encode this or maybe to um, positionally embed or in, sorry, positionally encode or apply word embedding to maybe long or short or other kind of word information. But I thought it would be equate to using one or negative one and keep everything as numerical. And also in terms of positional encoding, um, originally positional encoding was introduced uh, for the language model, uh, language yeah. sequence of the data. So yeah. for example, you say the method signal affirmer, it's like a, a, the position is zero, one, two, it's in one, di one D data. So yeah. here you have uh, 12 features, right? Yeah. And the sequence length is how many? I Sorry, I forgot uh -huh. your sequence length. Is that 10 or something? Uh, 120 in this example. 120. Whoa, that's yeah. all because you are minutes data. So it's yes. 120 and also you have 12 features. Yeah. So when it's pay attention, so you your, your positional encoding is applied on the sequence lens, right? Correct, yeah. So when it's paying attention, it's paying attention to the whole column. So for example, it's open, high, low, close. They all have the same uh, number for the positional encoding. Have you right. ever thought about to use 2D positional encoding? So make the open, high, each row and each column, each cell is a different uh, value as a yes. position. That was considered, and it was um, <clears throat> one limitation was based on the again on the process run times and the uh, sort of scheduled deadlines. But I think that that is an important point to experiment with, and what might lead to sort of better classification results. Um, in this sense, in the context of the data, given it's sequential row wise, 
the um, sort of just applying to one dimensional positional encoding seem to have different results and interesting, but I think the two dimensional is uh, quite an interesting extension, but it wasn't applied in this study. Mm -hmm. you, uh, do you think the position, positional encoding and um, how to say is an important factor for the perform model performance? I think so. It's tricky to say in this scenario because the results contradicted that the vanilla long short term memory performs mm -hmm. better. But in the context of the data, the, with this financial data, it, the, the point in time that we're looking to is very important. Maybe we pick a pattern that once every 50 mm -hmm. bars or so. So what I think, um, and if more time is allowed, uh, a way to experiment and really drill down on a positional, like the architectures, hyperparameters used in positional for the positional encoding models, and as well being able to apply it to a two-dimensional space, uh, but that well, it wasn't extended that far. But in the context of the data problem, I think positional encoding is a sort of very open avenue to improve the classification. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Patron. I think I'll stop recording.